I would like everyone to uh, bow their heads and uh, let's have a minute of prayer. Not in prayer. Everybody, everybody, just think about the song we just sang. Uh, raise a hallelujah to the God be the glory for the beautiful name it is. And uh, let's just spend a little time in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are such a uh, blessed people. Uh, Heavenly Father, we're, we're small in number right now, but we really believe that we're going to grow and as we hold firm to your teaching, your word, and uh, teach the truth, preach the truth, uh, encourage people, uh, love people, be unified. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the children that you have brought, thank you for each one of them. They are so special, and you have such a wonderful plan for them. We older adults can look back when we, when we were children, and uh, Heavenly Father, help us to encourage each one of these beautiful children here. Um, help us always to uh, have a, um, a good disposition and, and really to love on them and let them know how special they are. Um, Jesus has such a special place in his heart for children. And uh, he even said, unless you become like one of these little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And so, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we be here to worship you. Thank you for our church. Thank you for each person here. And Heavenly Father, we all want to, to serve you to the very best of our ability. And so, Heavenly Father, um, Help us to do that. Help us to be the, uh, the children of God that, that you want us to be. The children of God. And, and you love us with a, such a deep love that you sent your son to die on the cross for us. To die on the cross, a cruel cross, a horrible death. And uh, Jesus did not hesitate. Did not hesitate. And so, Heavenly Father, thank you. We praise you. We ask this all in Jesus' name and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, children, you're dismissed to children's church. Learn a lot. You got to go too? Dear Lord. Why don't we all go to children's church? Have you wanted <laughs> All right. Um, my sermon today, for those that are still here. <laughs> God and politics. Matthew 22, 15 to 22. Um, it is now... 11.32, I might go long today, but I will try to stay within the confines of it. So, um, God. Yes, yes, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. So, uh, God alone deserves our worship. Would you agree with that? God alone deserves, yeah. And so, um, in Matthew uh, 22, starting verse 15, uh, it says, Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. They sent, they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity uh, and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You are. Best things on sliced bread, and uh, so we. Uh, 
imperial tax to Caesar or not. And so they're trying to get him to talk against Rome, not pay taxes against Rome, get him in trouble with Rome, and, and get rid of him. And so, but Jesus is too smart for that. So, but Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. And he said, and he asked them, Whose image is this? And, uh, and whose inscription? Caesar, they implied. Then he said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is probably one of the most brilliant things. Jesus said a lot of really cool stuff, important. But this is probably one of the most brilliant things he ever said. And it really has um, an impact uh, for us today. And it's not in tithing. I'm not, talk, I'm not going to talk about tithing. Um, and so Jesus said to them, I just want you to let this sink in for a minute. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And then they left him. Um, so the Pharisees and Sanders, they were they were trying to trick Jesus. And uh, again, Matthew 26, 16, Teacher, they said, we know that you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth and you aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Um, then they said, what's your opinion? Pay taxes or not to pay taxes? Is it right? Um, in effect, what were they asking Jesus? What were they asking Jesus? Are you pro-Rome or are you against Rome? Okay, pro-Rome or anti-Rome? That, that could have been the death for Jesus, to, to go up against, against Rome. So his, his answer to that question um, was brilliant. And many sermons have been preached on that. And so, um, are you a political revolutionary getting ready to strike against Rome? Which one are you, Jesus? Come on, tell us. And so, we heard Jesus knew their evil intent. And so he called them hypocrites. <clears throat> you hypocrites. Uh, and he turned the tables on them. And then he says, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. You know, this statement is so God-centered. But it's also important for you and me this morning, um, given the fact that the elections are so close. Has everybody voted already, or you still got to vote? Okay. All right. I should have preached this a week ago. So, um, this has ramifications not only for this election, but for every election from now on. Um, what, what are you hoping to see? What really, honest to goodness, um, what are you hoping and wanting to see in the outcome of this election? What do you want to see? If there is one desire that should be in all our hearts, if there's one priority for you and this, this November, if there's one prayer I hope that you have been praying, it would be this, that followers of Jesus Christ would render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that belong to God, because we get them mixed up. I hope that your desire, as you look forward to voting day, I hope that your conviction, as you think about the upcoming election, uh, looking beyond November, um, I hope that you think about navigating the muddy waters of politics, that you remember, all of us remember, to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Perhaps you've been thinking about um, how, as a follower of Jesus, you should approach politics. Uh, one thing, I've talked to um, a few of the members here, 
And uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to tell you how to vote. I'm not going to tell you who I vote for. I'm not, I'm not anything about that. But I think um, at the end of the sermon, it will be crystal clear what you should do. Um, perhaps you're wrestling with what the Bible has to say about the way you vote. So let me tell you this. Here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do. Not conservative, not a liberal, not a Republican, not a Democrat, not a libertarian, but God-centered. God-centered. I want to follow Jesus Christ. Um, and that should shape, that should shape your life. That should shape the way you think. That should shape the way you vote. That should shape everything that you do. I, I really like the scene in The Chosen, and it's Matthew. I don't really care how they portray him, but Matthew the tax collector, and he's talking to one of the Roman guards, Gaius. I think I pronounced that right. And uh, so Matthew says, uh, Matthew says to Gaius, the Roman centurion, he says, he says, when I wake up in the morning, all I have to do is one thing: follow Jesus. Follow. Jesus. You know, it, it's very difficult, but it's really simple. When you wake up in the morning, we all have to do one thing. Follow Jesus. Follow our Savior. Um, so it's not conservative, it's not liberal, it's not Republican, it's not Democrat, it's not libertarian, it's God-centered. I want you as a follower of Jesus Christ and that shapes all that you do, all your thinking, including the way you think about politics and how you vote. God-centered is what Jesus was in his vision of politics. Notice several things, several, several very important things about render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God. First, a belief about ownership. <laughs> if God's name is on it, he owns it. If God's name is on something, he owns it. And God's name is on you. Jesus asked for a coin. But what's to pay the taxes? Show me the coin used to pay in taxes, Matthew 22, 19. Jesus knew full well what was on the coin, a picture of Caesar. Uh, if it's got Caesar's picture on it and name on it, therefore, give it to Caesar. It belongs to him. Notice second, there's a call for worship implied in this statement. Yes, give to Caesar what Caesar's name is on, but give to God what God's name is on. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. If you're going to give Caesar his due, you need to give God what is his due. But what is God's? What is God's? What does God have his name on? Where, where is God's likeness and inscription? What does God have claim to? What does God own? Where is his picture? Where is his name? Well, we need to go to Genesis. Genesis 1, 1 and 2, and then Genesis 1, 26 and 27. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. 27. So God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So let me ask you, followers of, and Christians, uh, and, not, and also non-Christians, where has the Creator placed his divine image? On what has he put his sovereign inscription? On coins? On temples? 
on churches, in churches. No, none of, none of these. Only one thing. You and on me. On you, on you and on me. On each one of us. Every human being that ever lived or shall live is made in the image of God. The Almighty God created you in his own image. You bear the image of God. Day in and day out, wherever you go, you bear the image of God. Whether it's Safeway, the Rosar, the Dennis, the Doctors, um, wherever you go, you bear the image of God. Therefore, Jesus says to us, give your taxes to Caesars by all means. Or to Uncle Sam, uh, who would um, But each and every one of us, Jesus says, give everything to God. Give everything to God. Give your whole self, your entire person, your very life to God. Um, as the Apostle Paul said in Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This statement by Jesus is a call to worship. To worship God because God created you. He made you. He owns you. <laughs> and you exist to worship Him and Him alone. Then thirdly, Jesus is giving us a warning against idolatry. As sinful humans, we're always confusing these two, blending them together. You know, a lot of times, we are giving to Caesar, we are rendering to Caesar what belongs to God. We get them confused, we get them mixed up. We're always mixing them up. Throughout history, we've always mixed them up. The people of Israel did. And tragically, so has the church of Jesus Christ giving to Caesar what should only be given to God. We have, you have, confused the two, blending the things that belong to Caesar with the things that belong to God. In your mind, there's very, there's very little difference between the mission of the church and the mission of the United States of America. When we let Caesar define our identity, when we let the state define our identity, we give to Caesar what doesn't belong to Caesar, what belongs to the church, what belongs to God. You have a closer affinity. This is a question. Do you have a closer affinity to those who share your same political views or your theological uh, convictions? I had someone, I had two people ask me, do I have to be of a certain political party to be a member of your church? That's terrible. Uh, I've, been, uh, I've been to Bible college and I've been to seminary and I've never taken a class on how to make someone uh, a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian. And I've never had a class like that. And that, yeah, somebody came and asked me, do I have to be a to join your church? Um, that, that, that's, that's terrible. I mean, uh, so do you have a closer friendship? You, you know, a closer friendship with people of your of your political party versus those of your faith? Um, we, we can really get into some arguments over um, politics. And we can really get into some arguments over theology. Um, but many times we are rendering to Caesar the things that belong to God. Um, are you letting Caesar uh, define who you are and what's most fundamental to you? In, in, your, in your voting, um, are, are you trying to, to vote so um, maybe things can be more comfortable rather than voting for what God would want, what the Bible says? Um, are we letting Caesar define who we are? 
it would be the greatest victory for Satan if he could use Caesar to divide the church of Jesus Christ. Where, where do your deepest loyalties lie? Who has your fundamental allegiance? Do you feel the greater sense of pride when your candidate gets elected or when Jesus gets honored? Do you feel deeply aligned? Do you deeply align yourself with your political party or with the people of God? Do you really understand what your political party believes? Do you really understand what the political party that you hold, they, that they really believe to the And are those beliefs in line with what the Bible teaches? Are the beliefs of your political party in line with what the Bible teaches? One political party has voted God out of their platform. They do not believe in God. They don't want to have anything to do with God. So Israel got sidetracked by looking to Caesar rather than God in difficult times. Who do we look to in difficult times? Do we look for the state to come to our aid or do we look for God to come to our aid? Amen. Yeah, it should, it first should be God. Let's read how the, uh, the prophet Isaiah, um, what, what the prophet Isaiah says. Um, to Israel about placing, placing their trust in Egypt rather than placing their trust in the living God. That's it, the living God. He's not a dead God. He's a living God. And Jesus is at the right hand of the Father right now. Right now, listening to this sermon, listening to all the other sermons, and making intercession for us. So Isaiah 31, verses 1 and then verse 3. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. Who, are, who are rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots and in the great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. But the Egyptians are mere mortals and not God. Uh, their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, those who help will stumble. Those who are helped will fall. All will perish together. Be careful, brother and sister, be careful not to pin your hopes on Caesar. Not to pin your hopes on the state. Not to pin your hopes on anything but on the Lord Jesus Christ, on God. Be careful not to pin your hopes on Caesar because in the end, Caesar will always disappoint. No matter how good or even how seemingly Christian Caesar seems. Because do not render to Caesar what belongs to God. Instead, hope in God and look to God alone. For God one day will establish his reign and rule upon this earth. And so, render to Caesar what is Caesar, and render to God what belongs to God. And so, I'm not sure how this election is going to turn out, but you, you know one thing, one thing, no matter who gets elected, our job here at Tuckwood Baptist Church does not change. Um, our, our mandate is still to go and make disciples. No, no matter what, our job will always be the same, no matter whether we get a good candidate or a bad candidate or someone that is for Christianity or against Christianity. It, it, doesn't, it may make our job a little harder, but our job is the same. Our job will always be the same. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, teaching them everything I've commanded you, 
and that's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So be, be really careful in, in your politics and as you check out, really check out what your political party really believes and then pray and ask God. Okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus' brilliant words. Render unto Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, but also render to God what is God. And Heavenly Father, we belong to God. We belong to you. We were bought with a price. We were bought with the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. He shed his blood. Shed his blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so in the Old Testament, they killed lambs and goats and bulls. Um, but Jesus shed his blood once for all. Once for all. When we believe in him, ask him to forgive us of our sins, um, he forgives us. And we have our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And one day we will all be in the marriage supper of the Lamb. We will all be together in heaven. And so Heavenly Father, help us. Help us to be discern discerning Christians. And not just to vote because it seems so good, but to really get the undercurrent of what a particular party believes. And are they in line with you? Are they in line with your word? Um, are they honoring Jesus? Um, help us, Heavenly Father. It's not easy. It's not easy. And so, um, whether it's this election or the following election, Heavenly Father, Please help us uh, surrender to God what belongs to God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So our closing hymn is Jesus' name above all names.